My name is Ray Bidigan. Uh, welcome everyone. If you don't know me, I'm the president of the Photography Council at the Portland Art Museum. Uh, we host a lecture by photographers on the third Wednesday of every month and have for the last, I don't know, eight or ten years. Um, and for the last handful of months, it's been online, which is a new thing for me. I'm getting used to it and I'm enjoying it because it allows us uh, to invite guests from out of town because as a rule, uh, we don't fly people in to give lectures. So it's kind of broadened our, our reach a little bit and I think that's been exciting. So thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to be on our mailing list and hear about future lectures, feel free to add your email address to the chat box and I'll add you to the mailing list for this series. It's called the Brown Bag Lecture Series. Uh, today we're excited. Uh, we have Robert Kalman here, uh, New York native photographer uh, and a portrait photographer primarily, uh, which is what I find interesting uh, as portrait photography is one of my favorite uh, genres. I think it's one of the things photography does best, honestly. Portrait photography is something that's key to photography in general. So I'm going to let Robert give his talk. Uh, look forward to lots of great pictures and remember to type in your questions and we'll answer them at the end. Here you go, Robert. Great. Thanks, Ray. Uh, just bear with me while we uh, do the screen share. And that up? Yes. Good. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Whoops. Uh, let's not start there. Let's go back a couple of oops. Of course, what would be, how would it be without, uh, without a small glitch? Hold on a sec. Sorry about this. But you all no. expected something like that. No okay. worries. There we go. Here we go. All right. So hello, and uh, I'm Robert Kalman. I see a lot of friends in the audience, and um, I'm sure I'll make some new ones by the time we're done. I am a documentary portrait photographer, and um, let's start off with this wonderful portrait document. Um, it may be familiar to some of you, and it's of a teenage boy taken in France in the early 1950s. And I certainly wish that I had taken it, but of course, those of you who recognize this photograph know that this was taken by the iconic Paul Strand. And um, here's Paul Strand and a small clip of, of him speaking about portraiture in general. The portrait of a person is one of the most difficult things to do because in order to do it, it means you must almost bring the presence of that person photographed to other people in such a way that they don't have to know, who, know that person personally in any way, but they still are confronted with a human being that they won't forget, that they uh, the image of whom they will never forget. That's a portrait. Okay, so if Strand is right, and portraits are one of the most difficult things to do, I'd like to begin this presentation, which is entitled, The Portrait of a Person is One of the Most Difficult Things to Do. I would like to start off by showing you some portraits that were made in a formal way, using a large format camera in the street, like I'm doing here in this photograph in um, Budapest. And uh, the first group of photographs um, are by way of introduction to a variety of projects that I'm going to be showing you with a little more commentary. So in this first pass, I'm going to uh, show you the photographs without any comments. Oh, uh, yes, I almost forgot. Uh, during the presentation, when I use the pronouns we and us, um, the we is a reference to my wife here, Linda, who is also my collaborator and assistant. And so now let me show you a, a group of pictures like leafing through a book with, without any comment.
So let me move into each series a little more deeply with some commentary, beginning with um, Nicaragua. I've actually had two long-term projects, portrait projects in Nicaragua. The first one started in 1990. And after an initial trip to the village of Larenaga, Nicaragua, where I used the 35 millimeter camera, I returned there with a four by five so that I could make portraits in a more formal way. And I did that over the course of four more trips to this village. So here's what I looked like over 30 years ago as I worked in this uh, little town. And as we zoom out, uh, you can see the young man over on the left whose portrait I was making. And this is the result. And I'm frequently asked by other photographers why, why I choose to shoot portraits using large format cameras. Well, I think it promotes a formal compositional structure, which really appeals to me. And the limitations of large format imposes, uh, well, the, the limitations large format imposes requires that I use a much more thoughtful approach to uh, making portraits. With a big film and a big negative, I get enhanced black and white tonal quality, which also appeals to me a great deal. And because the process is much slower and less spontaneous than when I use a handheld camera, I'm in a position to learn about and tell people's stories much more fully. People simply respond differently to the experience of being photographed with a big camera, no matter where I make those photographs. So this is Dahlia with her twin girls, Annette and Emma. Um, Dahlia actually uh, emigrated to Spain not long after I made this photograph, but the girls stayed in Central America and um, I'm frequently in contact with Dahlia. She tracked me down on Facebook and I also have a running dialogue pretty much over several months with uh, the little girl who's famous. Uh, Robert, I don't know if you can hear me, but I think you've frozen. I'm wondering if the weather has gotten you. There. You. Am I back? You're back. Where did I? Where did you drop me? Uh, just at the beginning of well, you were talking about the immigration and been in touch with our Dahlia. Okay. So, the little girl. This this little girl continues to uh, write me, but she's an adult now. This is this is Emma. I started to say that um, I rarely pose people. I f make the f portrait of them where I find them. Sometimes I adjust their position, but I want them to present themselves to the camera the way they wish to present themselves. And after the four trips to Larenaga in the early 1990s, I returned to this little village in 2010 and 2011, and I started a second project that involved making follow-up portraits with the villagers after a 20-year hiatus. It was an absolutely extraordinary experience for me to reconnect with folks after 20 years. While I was able to track down nearly 40 people from 20 years before, Unfortunately, not everybody was still alive. And that particular project generated this book, which included the reflections of many of the people who were featured on its pages. So here, for example, is Yaritza, who was around 12 years old when I made the first portrait on the left. And she is 31 years old in the image to the right. Here's what she had to say, and we asked her to write it down. So here's her original Spanish version. Here's the English. Yaritza Maria Martinez, 31 years old, 
As a child, my parents gave me away to my grandmother, who was very abusive. She beat me constantly without reason. To get out of this situation, I got married at 15. I'm still with my husband today, and we have two children. From my childhood experiences, I learned the importance of being patient. I'm very protective of my children, and I'm working hard to give them a better future. Mm. So when you look at the pictures now that you've heard her words the te and the accompanying text, um, perhaps the images read a little bit differently. This is Mercedes in 1990. Uh, when I came and photographed her, she had this goiter condition. 20 years later, I was shocked that she was still alive because uh, healthcare in Nicaragua is not very strong. But um, thankfully she um, was cured of this condition. So I was able to meet her again and make her portrait. Uh, Fidelina was a very healthy campesina when I met her in the 90s. Unfortunately, uh, she lost her right leg to diabetes. And this is Faustino. I love this story. W when we visited him in 2011, I handed him a picture, this photo of himself, and um, I asked her, I wanted to take another photo. Faustino insisted that this was not a picture of him. Um, he was adamant and it was all we could do to convince him to allow me to take the second picture, which I did. Um, later, one of the townspeople told me that um, she thinks he was so impoverished at the time of the first picture that he was just simply embarrassed. So I'm gonna pause for just a second at this juncture and just say a few words about why I choose to make portraits. You heard Strand directly say that it's the most difficult thing to do. The same sentiment was voiced by Strand's contemporary, Henri Cartier-Bresson, who said this, the most difficult thing for me is a portrait. You have to try and put your camera between the skin of a person and his shirt. Now that idea was further amplified for me by the contemporary photographer, Raymond Meeks, who looked at a portfolio of my work during a workshop. And Raymond said this to me, without question, the most difficult photograph to make well is a portrait. Tell me, why do you do it? So I have no clear recollection of what I may have said to Raymond on the day he asked me the question. But on reflection, here's how I would answer the question today about why I make portraits. First, there's this concept promoted by the educational philosopher, John Dewey, who said the deepest urge in human nature is the desire to be important. And to give full disclosure to the people who don't know me, um, I had a parallel career while I was uh, a document, while I am a documentary photographer, uh, for 40 years, I was an elementary school principal. And I followed this principle from John Dewey in the work that I did with children and adults, um, paying attention to social and emotional and affective needs while I led my schools. So imagine I approach you in the street and I say, I really, I'm impressed with you. I want to make your photograph. Think about how that plays into people's desire to be recognized and feel significant and important. A second reason why I take portraits is contained in this traditional African uh, greeting and response. Sometimes the two phrases are juxtaposed, but we'll do them this way for this presentation. You know, here as a New Yorker, I meet somebody in the street, I say, hey, how you doing? And, uh, but in Africa, people are more inclined to say, I see you. Now, if you th sit with that for a moment, I see you implies more than just, I physically can see you. It has to do with the layers underneath the physicality. And I am here to be seen, strikes me as 
the perfect response of someone who agrees to allow me to make their photograph. I've said, I see you, and they say, go ahead. And the third reason I make portraits is contained in this quote from the great August Sander, who said, every person's story is written plainly on the face, though not everyone can read it. And I wanna be the person not only who reads it, but who presents it to you. So meanwhile, back at home in the early 2000s, I spent lots and lots of time in the streets searching for just the right New York faces and attitudes. Uh, this is Elise. I love how she just struck this pose. I also used in that series, um, I use the environment to establish a sense of place and to frame the subjects. I'm gonna run through the New York portraits without comment. And then sometime in 2007, we were making those kinds of portraits in the street when I saw this absolutely stunning older couple walking along ahead of us arm in arm. They looked to be mm, about in their 60s. She was this lovely silver haired white woman and her companion was a tall, extremely handsome, elegant African-American man. And for some inexplicable, inexplicable reason, I just couldn't summon the confidence to approach them and ask them if we could make their portrait. So consider that this slide shows the photo that never got made. But then photos of interracial couples did get made. And every time we would go out making portraits, we'd see interracial couples everywhere. And so we began this wonderful project that wound up as a book and a strong exhibit that I entitled no difference between them. In fact, uh, four years after I published this book, um, I was making a, a portraits in the street. I get uh, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around. It's a young man looking at me said, hi, you're Robert Kelman, aren't you? I said, yes, I'm sorry, I don't know you. He said, oh yeah, look, you took my photo and put it on the cover of your book. No difference between them. I went, oh, Isaac, I do remember you. And Janella, how are you guys? He said, well, about two weeks after you took the photo, we broke up. But I like being on the cover. So <laughs> here are some more interracial couples. I, just proving to me that love is absolutely colorblind. And we were still in the midst of this uh, interracial couples project when we took a vacation and visited Barcelona. And I said to the person who uh, was acting as our guide for the first few days, if she wouldn't take us to uh, the Bohemian section of town, I explained that we were interested in meeting interracial couples. And she said to us, interracial couple? Oh no, here in Barcelona, <clears throat> excuse me, we never do that. That's just unheard of. This is one of uh, 12 couples we met and photographed in Barcelona, only proving to me that um, interracial relationships are managed all over the world. And we extensively have traveled all over Europe. And when we do, we generally spend the equivalent of two weeks being tourists and two weeks working to make portraits in the streets. So this next section 
has snaps from a variety of European cities. I think because we don't have a specific project when we're traveling like this, the portraits tend to be good standalone pieces rather than a unified collection. And this is uh, Gabor in uh, Budapest. Um, he didn't speak a word of English and obviously we don't speak Hungarian and we didn't have a guide with us. So just in case you're wondering, uh, when we don't have anybody to help us, we prepare what we need ahead of time so that we can just present the person with our quote shooting script. Um, this is basically what we say everywhere, but here I'll read the, not the Hungarian, but the English translation. Hello, my name's Robert Kalman. This is my partner, Linda. We're photographers from the US and we're working on a book about people in Budapest. Here are examples of the kind of work that we do. And we always have a portfolio that we show people. Usually it's highly convincing. We would like to take your picture. We think you have an interesting face. It will only take a few minutes and we'll give you a copy. Of course, that was in the days of Polaroid when we gave them a copy on the spot. Ever since Polaroid um, has gone away, we email a, uh, an electronic copy or we send them a paper copy. As you can see, this is a very old style camera, it works very slowly, so it's very important that you are standing very still. And then, um, because we failed so many times with that, I had to add this last little paragraph because those of you who uh, work with large format know that when you put the cloth over your head, you're only focusing and you have to put the cloth over your head so you can actually see the image on the glass. So I had to put in this. When I'm under the cloth behind the camera, I'm focusing. When I stand next to the camera, I will need for you to simply look at me. I will make three pictures. Because when we didn't say that, the minute I emerged off out of the dark cloth, people would move thinking it was over. I just want to pause at this and make a couple of comments. So I think this is a great example of a local phenomenon of being famous. And it happens constantly wherever we go. We were having lunch in a restaurant in Istanbul when I saw this woman at another table in this very stylish outfit. So I asked our Turkish speaking companion at the table if he would approach her and ask her if we could make her portrait. And it turned out that she spoke English she agreed and she also agreed we'd do it after lunch. So during lunch, my friend Husnu suddenly turned white. He stopped eating. He said, my God, that's Murkan. I, I, I have to go apologize. So it turned out that he didn't recognize this um, international singer, celebrity from Turkey, she had a big celebrity there. Uh, so she was easy to work with. She was delightful, cooperative. Of course, we had no idea who she was, so um, I wasn't starstruck. I guess the equivalent would be if we like ran into uh, Beyonce in a restaurant and asked her to pose. Um, this particular phenomenon happens with a great deal of frequency, but apparently it happens the most to us when we're in Budapest. I'm going to show you some folks. I had no idea that they were local celebrities when I approached them and asked them to make their photograph. This is a woman named Myra Felusi. She's a media artist, quite well known in Hungary. This is Adam Felegi, who is a international concert pianist. This young woman, her name is Gabriela Toth, and she was the winner of the Hungarian version of America's Got Ta uh, Talent. This is a young woman named Tilla Torok, T-O-R-O-K. She's a very famous violinist who has a band. You can look her up on um, YouTube and see, uh, in fact, you can see some of the uh, other folks on YouTube as well. And you can see this woman on YouTube. This is Hesna Algawi. Hesna Algawi is a war correspondent 
She's Hungarian and she's based in Hungary, but she's been all over the world. When we made this photograph of her, we didn't know she was famous. Um, she complained to my wife that she had just come from the beauticians and she's getting married and she didn't like the way her hair was styled. So she was upset. So. And then our travels took us back to Central America to uh, San Blas, which is an archipelago off the coast of Panama. It's also known as Gunayala. Uh, it's the home to the indigenous Guna people. And we returned several times over the years. So unlike Europe, we were there basically just to make portraits, not to be tourists. So I think the collection of these photographs is a little more coherent. Every um, island has a chief. This is a chief of one of the islands with his grandson. This is um, a Guna woman in typical native dress. The women are uh, known worldwide for these appliques that they put on their blouses. They're called molas. They sew one onto the front and one onto the back. And when they're done with them, after a while, they take them off and they sell them to tourists. So uh, when uh, ships wait for their turn to enter the Panama Canal, cruise ships uh, unload passengers, put them in little boats and send them to the island so that they can buy molas and other souvenirs. And it's very colorful and tourists like to take photographs of the natives. Um, so the Kuna always ask tourists to pay them when they take their pictures, sort of like the folks in Times Square. Um, so we were told we would have to pay them as well. But these were the days when we still had Polaroid and I would make the Polaroid first and then I would make uh, the film copies and I always presented the Polaroid. So we never had to pay anybody any money. In fact, once the villagers knew that we were giving away photos, when we'd arrive at an island, the mothers would present, their, they'd line up when we were getting off the canoe and present their children to us so that we could make their portrait. This is a shaman. This young woman, you'll notice she's not in um, native attire. Um, she's actually, she told us, explained to us she's a lesbian. And it's very interesting in the Kuna culture, the Kuna are very, very tolerant of homosexuality in men, but they are intolerant of women who are lesbians. And so this woman was basically shunned by other members of her village. I absolutely love this portrait of, um, um, I can't think of her name. Oh, Isabel, thank you. Um, yeah, I have a 50 by 50 inch uh, portrait of her over my fireplace. She is just a stunning, stunning woman, elegant. And one ongoing project we have when we travel is to make portraits of the local police. It really is fascinating to observe how police carry themselves in different countries. For the most part, when we ask uh, police officers to make their portraits, many cops are reluctant to pose by themselves, although a few do. These two police officers in Santiago, Chile, they were observing us from a distance. Um, after a while, they approached us and asked us what we were doing. And we explained we were making photos of people in Santiago. And so one of them said, okay, then please make one of us. So we did. Uh, compare the actual, uh, the, these two men pose themselves. Notice the difference in their body language to these Italian police, these Roman policemen. They, they, they just pose themselves this way. I love the fact that, first of all, there's a wonderful range of tones in this portrait. I have a 40 by 50 inch copy of this over my sofa in my living room. But what I really love is the fact that all of these men show their individuality by making 
uh, a pose that is like no other in the in the in the group. So these are the Roman police. And when I approached these cops in Lisbon, I approached this cop and I showed him the portfolio of cops. When they leafed through it, he stopped at this one, said something in Portuguese, and all of these guys laughed. So I can imagine what they said. But they did agree to pose and notice how they arranged themselves in this macho uh, legs shoulder width apart kind of stance. It's uh, become a cliche to photograph somebody in front of like graffiti or wall art that, but this was like irresistible. And the police officer in New York said we could make the photo of him. And I think he only said we could do it because he was a rookie and he didn't know any better. And this is back in Lisbon. These are military police and um, when they, uh, we wanted to make the photograph of the two of them, the male insisted, this is Tomas, he insisted that they pose separately. And you can see that he took a very, very different position than his female partner. And then there's this um, back in Budapest at the Opera House. So I approached this soldier, uh, but yeah, he looked like a soldier. Uh, I approached him and he spoke English and I said, you know, we take pictures of police and soldiers all over the world. Can we take, and he was with another group of uh, police officers. So he said something in Hungarian and they burst out laughing. I said, what? He said, we're not police, we're actors. We're in a Bruce Willis movie and you just missed him. He was here 10 minutes ago. <laughs> but so he let us take this photo of him. I just couldn't resist. This this man is this man's son. He was also in the movie. Um, I think it was one. Of, it was one of the Die Hard movies. H Hungary is known for um, the film, a, a place where film companies go. So back in New York, I started using the eight by ten format exclusively for almost all of my work, and you can see I. Uh, those of you who are familiar with what 8x10 can do, I no longer use the environment to frame. I just blew out the background and used the 8x10's uh, small, a short depth of field to get this wonderful creamy effect in the backgrounds. Um, the inconvenience of using even a bigger camera that weighs more, costs more, to, uh, fil the film costs more, all the impositions of working even more slowly, carefully, patiently, it only convinced me further, this is exactly the format for me. So we began a project looking for people with a certain presence and I posed them in front of the eight by 10. And then I asked them to write about what they would like viewers of the portraits to know, a portrait to know about them. And just like the work in Nicaragua, I think that the resulting diptychs are really quite remarkable in terms of what people wrote about. So this is Walter, he's a dancer, and he said, I am a road, I am only me, I am the future, I am change. This is Jin Sang Ling, who wrote, my grandfather passed away last Thursday. It's so sad I can't go back to China to be with him and my family. I feel this might be the sacrifice I have to make to get more from life. I know his spirit is still here with me. And then there's Ava, uh, Ava, who wrote, being recently diagnosed with bipolar and borderline personality disorder, my dreams seem so much narrower and I want to change that. And I use the same approach of pairing text with the portraits for a project of lesbians uh, which I dedicated to my late sister, Hillary. Uh, she, she came out of the closet in 1976 and a few weeks after she had told family members that she was a lesbian, I asked her what her life was like. And she responded by showing me this note that our mother had written to her. Hillary, I didn't realize how much you hate me. 
So it took my sister years to uh, get over that um, rejection. But I used this idea of incorporating a writing prompt and it originally came from this pairing. And I dedicated these pictures to my sister's memory. The writing prompt I gave them was, what's life like for you right now? And most of them gave an upbeat and very optimistic appraisal of themselves. This is Judith who said, I'm learning that you don't need a reason to help others. And Chelsea told us that she was living the dream. Louise said, your body has already learned to crane toward the sunshine. All you need to do is follow. And the work that we did with the lesbian community really was so gratifying. It generated two exhibitions and a book. And I decided, therefore, to extend the project of working with members of the LGBT community by concentrating on two very different yet similar groups. I focused on transgender women known as Omagid in the Guna Indian community. And I made images of transgender men and women in Israel. And I found both groups to be assertive in expressing their expectation that people were just going to need to accept them as they are. And I think that sentiment tends to come out in many of the portraits. So I've placed an Omagid and an Israeli side by side. This is Yene, who told us that she knew when she was five years old that she was meant to be a woman, a girl and a woman. And this is Captain Ofer Eretz, who started his army career as a female, rose through the ranks. As she rose through the ranks, she started the transition to become a trans man. And when she finished her service, she was a captain in the uh, Israeli Defense Forces. This is Kei Chu, who uh, actually faced rejection on her island. So she now lives in Panama City. And this is Omeg, uh, Omog, who uh, was also rejected, told he could never play basketball with, with boys again. Um, an an another Israeli said to me, this is a very strict gender society. And here's what I want people to know. I'm here and I'm queer. And the really fascinating thing is that across the world, an Omegid told me the exact same thing. She told me in the machismo culture of my country, I encounter much disrespect. People need to know Omegid exists and understand that we are here to stay. And this is Jonathan. He's a social worker. Jonathan is a trans man. He's married to another man. And his story is uh, quite interesting, I think. He uh, is married to another man and uh, they decided they wanted to have a child. So Jonathan went off his hormones, male hormones, started to ovulate again. Um, he got pregnant, she got pregnant. Um, they had the baby and what they insisted on was that the baby's birth certificate show that the baby had two fathers because um, Jonathan went back on his uh, male hormones. Well, the hospital, unbeknownst to the parents, uh, changed the birth certificate back to saying that Jonathan was a female. They were outraged and they took the hospital authorities to court and they won. So the baby's birth certificate does say that they have two fathers. This is Deborah and Omagid and her step, uh, her adopted daughter, Bernie Bett. Bernie Bett was the daughter of Deborah's sister and brother-in-law, and they both died of AIDS. So Deborah adopted her niece and is now her mother and has to told us that she wants nothing else but to give 
her daughter a good life. So returning to making portraits locally at the start of 2017, I decided that I wasn't engaging in the experience of making portraits in the street difficult enough. So I learned how to work with the 19th century photographic process of wet plate collodion. So we set up in Tompkins Square Park in New York City, which is the Bohemian section of the East Village. And I made these portraits using collodion and I entitled it A Fleeting Intimacy. And um, I'm understand, I, uh, Ray had told me that some of you in the audience from uh, Oregon are wet plate workers. So you know that wet plate requires that the subject maintain their presence and their concentration for at least four to six seconds while the photograph is being made. And as a result, I believe that momentary intimacy and trust and vulnerability are all significantly heightened. And you get a much, much different portrait when you use this approach and this method. So for me, a collodion portrait is the quintessential expression of the African exchange of, I see you, I am here to be seen. So I'd like to finish up where we began. Strand, observe that a portrait confronts you with a person you will never forget. And I'm hoping that you've seen someone today that makes his observation resonate for you. Now, while you're busy thinking of a question or a comment that might have come up for you and you're putting it into the chat box, um, if you'd like to email me and ask me a question that doesn't get answered today, there's my email address, ladenaga13 at gmail. If you want to text me, there's my number or call me. I am found on Instagram at, at robt ropt kalman. And my website is Robert Kalman Webb, where uh, quite a number of the books that you've seen today are available there. And so I appreciate your um, presence and uh, see if you have any questions. Well done, Robert. I couldn't help but laugh at some of those stories. Come on, the thing about Bruce Willis. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry I missed them. Uh, so there's some questions, both in question and answers and the chat box, if you can okay, see. Okay, so... Uh, okay, there are a couple of, a few thank yous. Oh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your process. How do you do wet plate of street photography? Um, that's from Ron. Um, Oh, thanks for the question. Um, we actually use the same approach we use to stop people. I, I cast about for people whose uh, appearance interests me. And so we stop them. We explain what we're doing. We show them samples of collodion. 
work and then we um, we've already set up everything so all the chemistry and everything the dark box is there on site and um, we make the we make the portrait and so we photograph them in the street Naomi has asked whose portraits do you go back to for inspiration most often um, I have so many heroes uh, you know, in addition to people like Paul Strand, uh, Joel Meyerowitz, Sally Mann, um, uh, uh, Judith Joy Ross, they're just, uh, uh, Alice Tomlinson is a, a photographer. I'm uh, Vanessa Winship. I'm, there are just so many. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm loaded with... Um, I studied with Arnold Newman, who taught me how to make environmental portraits. And for a great deal of time, I used to be a freelance photographer using um, large format. So I'd come and I'd make portraits using the environment. So Arnold also was a big influence. Um, thank you, beautiful work. Use the Q&A box, okay. Uh, Ellen Jacobs said she had a question, but she's having a hard time working the chat. And she wants you to, uh, we could turn her on to ask in person if she wanted to do that, but I don't know. Do you know her well? I know, yes. <laughs> Bring her on. Ellen, do you want to ask your question live? You just said that. There you are. I actually didn't have a question. I just oh. couldn't see the chat to read everyone else's, but Robert, that was fabulous. And I wanted to know what you, I mean, as long as I'm talking to you, it was really great to see all your work and to see it all in one place. So thank you, Ray, so much for hosting this. But, um, you know, I do, I'm wondering what you do when people don't want to have their portrait. If you keep portrait, if you go after them, if you leave them alone, um, what's your sort of theory on, uh, on that from an ethical point of view, not from a... Yeah, you know, you can't force them. Um, you occasionally... I'll say something like, oh, sometimes a person will say, well, why, why are you stopping me? And my first response is, well, why not you? And then I'll point out that, you know, there are hundreds of people walking in the street, but I stopped you. You, you really have a presence that I'd like to capture on film. And of course, we'll give you a lovely copy in here. But if they're not convinced, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense to go any further. It's just, it, it, it will show in the photo. In fact, several times in Europe, people like were a little bit confused because of the uh, language barriers. So they agreed, but it was clear they were sorry they agreed. So we gave them a copy, but you know, we got sometimes pictures that weren't very usable, portraits that weren't very, very usable. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. Ellen. Oh, oh, Ron Hammond said my mental image of a, is of a horse-drawn wagon darkroom. Do you sensitize and process the plates on site? Your dark box must not be exactly portable. No, the dark box is portable, Ron. Um, and uh, the horse, we retired the horse years ago. Um, <laughs> but yes, we sensitize and process right there on the spot. As I'm, I'm guessing you're a wet plate collodion guy, so you know there's no other way to do it. It's just highly inconvenient, but the results are incomparable. So speak to that a little bit, Robert. Are you talking about the results of the experiment or the look of the picture? Both. Um, Both. Yeah. Just having someone hold still for four to six seconds, you know, the usual eight by 10 image takes maybe an eighth of a second and I pray because I have no depth of field to work with that they stay absolutely still during the eighth of a second. Usually four to six seconds, I have to brace them against something. Um, Pat is asking, uh, how much time do you spend with your subjects after they've agreed to be photographed? You say you let them pose themselves, but they seem so comfortable. I wonder how you set them at their ease. So um, that's a great question, Pat. Um, we spend about 20 minutes 
the, from start to finish, especially if someone we ask someone to write something, then we get them to actually write it out in their own handwriting so we can use it later. Um, we, uh, the first contact is made by my collaborator, Linda. I just think it's easier for a person to relate to a woman in the street, being approached in the street. And so Linda makes the first contact, convinces them by showing them a portfolio, brings them over to me. And I, I just simply engage them and I gather up rapport and the camera itself um, helps people understand this is a serious event and they present themselves not in the pleasing cheesy way that we all have you know is this my good side you know uh, do you uh do you make something like a digital picture of them with your phone that you use later to id them I, I track no, we, who's who we take all their contact information and then i'll write something about them on my pad so because in a typical day in the street, we make from sort of six to 10 portraits, a little less when we're doing collodion because it takes so much longer. But um, yeah, the, um, I lost the question. What'd you say, Rick? Well, I'm trying to think how you keep track of which negatives oh, go with I first person. Down. Like for you, I'd say uh, young man with the uh, goatee and the beret. Who's incredibly handsome and and has uh, you know something in his ears. Nice. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, so you don't ever lose track and get people confused. I mean that would be a no, my. Opinion. We also take their contact information. So if I forget them, I'll say, "Who are you again?" I never remember to actually take a phone image. So let's see if we got anything else here. Um, some more chat. I, no, maybe not. Um. Oh, can you post this email uh, again? Yes. Um, I can do that in the chat, I think. Let's see if I can, or you can. Uh, actually, uh, um, oh yeah, yeah. And George is asking, uh, do you ask for a model's release? So you can answer that as you're typing maybe. Always. Do you give him any remuneration at that time? No. Uh, Occasionally, someone asks for money. Um, usually, they ask ahead of time. Um, I very, very rarely pay people. Um, the payment is in the in the image. So, you know, well, once they've est I've established with them my bona fides, the, you know, showing them, look, I have published work, and I'd like to maybe publish you in a book. Um, and it's all for art. It's not a, you know, I, I tell them I promise not to sell toothpaste with your image. Um, they're usually agreeable and they sign the model release. Occasionally, when I send them the copy, if they really hate their image, some people have asked me not to use it. And I um, always honor their wishes. That makes sense. Okay. Um, I don't, does anybody else have a question here at the last minute? Um, Naomi, I oh. reposted the um, email address. Uh, it's showing up. Okay, I guess it's. It's in the chat, yeah. I think it's there. All right. Um, thank you, Robert, very much. It's been fun. I'm glad you didn't blow away during your storm there. Yeah, it's uh, the sun's out now. Oh, good. Good. Thanks. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Thank okay. you everybody for coming.